There you go. I'll press a little bit uh, for just a second on a continuation of what I thought was just really, really good. It's really, really basic. It's really, really simple, but it's really, really good. First of all, let me go. It, it seems like every time, Brother Rick, that I preach, you sing a song, it just clicks right on in there. So my plea, we say 256. Now, couldn't help. I wasn't, you know, it talks about the blood of Jesus. That's really all you need to talk about right there. Amen. Just the blood of Jesus. But then you go down here to 5 and 13 over there, 1 John, and it says, He, so this is a continuation of what your pastor preached to you this morning. He that hath the Son, S-O-N, hath life. He and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You don't have to have a degree. You don't have to get real complicated. He told you this morning, your pastor did, and I was amening and amening and amening and I'll amen right now. It's God's simple plan of salvation. He didn't make it complicated for you. We make it complicated. Right. Now, I told my wife on the way to church that Christians, not lost people, Christians, for as long as I've been living for the Lord, I'd have to probably raise my hand on this myself, have been looking for something to do to merit salvation until I realized there was nothing I could do. That God did it all for me. And if there was anything that I could do, he wouldn't have had to do what he did. Amen. It is through his shed blood. These things I have written unto you that believe, believe, Amen. <laughs> believe, there it is. I didn't say sorry, I didn't say if you're sorry. You can be as sorry as you want to be. And I hope you were sorry when you realized the lost condition you were in. But that's not what saved you. Jesus saved you. Jesus, when he went to the garden of Gethsemane, he looked in that cup. He saw you. He drank that cup. He drank you. He drank your sin, not his sin. So you got me fired up this morning, so it's just going to continue right on. Believe. I, you know, uh, Brother Rick, I was going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth about preaching on believe or preaching what I've prepared all week for. Sometimes you've got to preach what God gives you on your heart. That you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe. On the name of the Son of God. It's never, never been complicated. It's just we make it complicated. Well, all, everybody's always trying to add something to. They'll even say if you do this, but make sure it's Christ alone. This and this and Christ alone. Well, if it's Christ alone, what do you got to do this and this for? That's right. Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right. Bible says that if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart. He just talked to you this morning about your heart. What proceeds out of your mouth comes first out of your heart. Right. And believe that God has raised him from the dead. Thou, that you shall be saved. Amen. John 3.16 There's some people that I will turn over here to John 3.16 and read just so they know and I could quote it word for word but just so they know that this is what the Bible says. Yes. For God so loved the world that's you. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth right. in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. So if I believe it, I'm not going to perish. 
It didn't say that I had to be sorry. It didn't say that I had to do anything but believe it. Now listen, I know that 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved, but workman unto God that needeth not to be the shame, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. But I believe there's some things and some verses you can just stand right there. And that's one of them. Yep. For God so loved the world. Amen. John 3, 16. If I give you that verse, I'll give you nothing else. I'm not taking that verse out of context. I'm not taking that verse and not comparing it to another piece of scripture, although I can in many of them. Yeah. For God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but through him that the world might be saved, he that believeth, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not. He that believeth is, he that believeth not is not. You either are or you are not. You can attend this church every Sunday morning, Sunday night. You can come and meet Brother Tim on Thursday night. You can come to Sunday school, Children's Church. You can start a class on Tuesday and Saturday. But if you don't know Christ, you're going to die and go to hell. Because it's not about what you do, but who you know. You can do nothing to inherit eternal life Amen. but believe. I had a man that's a good and godly man. <laughs> tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of knowledge, wisdom, and education. I'm not against education. I told you that before. I don't have any, but I'm not against it. But he told me, that's what I can't understand, what people can't understand about believing there is a God and believing in God. You can believe there is a God and yes, you will die and go to hell unless you've accepted that God. But to believe in that God is to trust that God. So I'm trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And if you know of anything else that i got to do, please see me because I'm lost. Because that's what I'm basing my eternal life on. Amen. I'm basing it on the fact that there's nothing that I've ever done, could ever do, or will ever do to inherit eternal life. I'm basing my salvation based upon the blood that was shed on the cross at Calvary. I'm uh, basing my salvation based upon the third day when the stones rolled away and he rose again. Amen. God raised him from the dead. Amen. I'm basing my salvation on the fact that he was seen of over 500 witnesses. I'm basing my salvation with the two men that walked with him after his resurrection on the road to Emmaus. He came, he bled, he died, he rose again, and praise God, he's coming again. Amen. And if he comes within the next split second, I'm out of here. Amen. I know I am. And why do I know I am? Because of 1 John 5, 13. Because he wrote these things that I may know that I know that I have eternal life through Jesus Christ my Lord. That's not the message. But that is a message. Amen. If you don't get anything else out of the message, you get that. Now turn in your Bible, and we will talk a little bit about a man after God's own heart. And this morning, uh, Pastor Tim also talked about this man, and but we'll see it in a little bit different context. Praise the Lord, because I thought I was going to have to develop another context, <laughs> but I didn't. But before we do, let's go to God in prayer. I dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord God, that I say everything you'd have me to say, say nothing that you wouldn't have me to say. I pray, Lord God, that uh, for the ones that are gathered here, that you give each and every individual, and for the ones that may be watching each and every individual, what you would have that individual to have. Help me to uh, 
hide myself and, and step aside and just let you preach what you laid upon my heart for these people. I'm, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. And I promise you, it is, it is not me. <laughs> I, and I was telling somebody this morning, I, you know, if I depend upon myself, I'm going to fail. If I depend upon Christ, then even though I'm not even worthy to stand up here and preach to you, uh, Christ will deliver to you what you need. So that's my prayer every time that Brother Tim or whatever opportunity presents itself, presents itself to me. So the text, uh, we're going to preach about <coughs> overcoming tra or turning, turning tragedy into triumph. You already heard my message? No. No, okay. <laughs> I hope not. I didn't come here from nobody. <laughs> Turning tragedy into trial. And we're going to talk about a little bitty town. I'll bet you know that too. Called Ziklag. And at Ziklag, there was tragedy and there was trial. There was tragedy when David tried to do things of his own accord. There was trial when David turned things over to God. So in, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thy horn with oil and go, and I will send, to thee, and I will send thee to Jesse, the son of the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his, among his sons. So God... You know, if you study the the life of David out through the scriptures, it's really, really rich, really, really high, and it's really, really low. Uh, we'll talk about uh, some high moments, and we'll talk about some low moments. The low moments are obviously, once again, things that David, as we do in our lives, and you can make it, we want to make the application of things that happened to David on things that happened to us. Brother Wayne preached to you on Wednesday night about the repercussion or the consequences of sin. So you can sin all you want to, but until you get on your knees and then be sorrowful and repent of those sins, then God's not going to be with you. Uh, and, and, you know, David, uh, he was a man after God's own heart. God chose David to be king of Israel. David was king of Israel, king of Judah. Uh, so we'll start right here, uh, 16. We started at 16 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? So, and before David was Saul. And, and Saul, uh, in a nutshell, uh, didn't do what the Lord asked him to do. And by not doing what the Lord asked him to do, and David being uh, always uh, having in his heart, he didn't always do with his mind, but, and what he did do with his mind, he got in trouble, but when he did with his heart, he followed God. That's why God chose David. Uh, David was the uh, youngest of eight sons. And David was a ruddy man. Uh, ruddy, the best I could tell. Whether he had red hair, I don't know. But that's kind of what it means. But he was a well-favored man. Uh, a man of great complexion and goodly to look upon. But when David was being chosen in verse 7 of this chapter, it says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on the countenance or on the height of his stature because I have refused him meaning rejected him and he was talking about Elab for the Lord seeth not for the Lord seeth not as man seeth for man looketh on the outward appearance but the Lord looketh upon the heart so God chose David because again David was a man after his own heart so through the scriptures, they, they call all of Jesse's sons up, uh, and it, they had to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, and the Lord has not chosen these. And then we come uh, to David. 
in verse number 12. Now he sent and brought him in, talking about David. Now he was ready and with all a beautiful countenance and goodly to look upon. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, this is he. So it, whatever David accomplished, and uh, he accomplished a lot uh, in his time, was because of God. God had a plan for David's life. God had a purpose for David's life. And where God has a plan and God has a purpose, God provides a provision. So God took care of David even through the bad times, even at Ziklag. So David, as Pastor uh, talked about this morning, he stands up and, and he says, uh, David came to Saul, stood before him in verse 21, and he loved him greatly and became his armor bearer. And Saul sent Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee. So David came. And then uh, Goliath shows up, uh, the giant Philistine. And I don't know if I did the numbers right. It'll be close within an inch or two, somewhere around nine foot, six inches. Yeah. That's a big man. He was big, he was tall, he was burly. But David didn't fear. David did not fear Goliath. David didn't fear Goliath because David knew who was going to fight that battle for him. David didn't fear Goliath, not of his own good, but he said, God will deliver thee into my hands. So in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17 and verse 34, David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion. He, Brother Tim talked about this this morning. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Now, verse 36 and 37 is what I really want you to pay attention to. So he killed a bear and he killed a lion. But in verse 36 37, he says, Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. David had a lot of confidence, didn't he? Yep. But David had confidence in God. Seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. Right. David said, moreover, in verse 37, the Lord hath delivered me out of the pot. Who delivered him? The Lord delivered him. Right. So the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, and he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Amen. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Amen. And David went, and the Lord was with David. Amen. Uh, we know what happened, and then we know that Saul... Uh, well, let's go to 45, verse 45. Same chapter, 17. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord. He doesn't say I come with five stones. He just said I come in the name of the Lord. Amen. So uh, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled, this day the Lord will, de this day the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head off of thee. And what did he do? He smote him and took his head off of him. Amen. Now he did this in confidence because he knew God would fight his battles for him. Right. He knew that God would deliver him from off thy head and I will give thee I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know so what's, what's he say right here? That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And I'll promise you, the Palestinians of today will know there is a God in Israel. Amen. I know where you guys stand. And I stand with Israel. I stand with Israel because God stands. Look at they are God's chosen people. So they can run all the flags over the University of Tennessee they want to. They embarrass me. I'm embarrassed for the University of Tennessee. University of North Carolina makes me want to puke. University of Columbia, you, I mean, you would think, no. But this is the state of affairs that we're at right now. 
This is the state that we live in. But it's not really anything that the Bible doesn't says it will be in the end times. But this tells me right here that that trump over there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16, 17, 18 is getting ready to sound. And when the trump of God sounds and the dead in Christ go first and we which are alive and remain will be caught up in the air and my brother is, and my sister says comfort one another with these words. So you don't have to worry about how many protests they got going over here. You don't have to worry about how many protests they got going on over here. You just stay focused as David stayed focused right here with a man that was nine foot six inches. And all he had was a stone in his hand and a slingshot. And he hit right there, right square, right there, dead in the forehead. I don't think, I don't know, I, I bet he never, ever moved. He just went straight down, out of here. And it came to pass in verse 48, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near unto David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put it in his hand in his bag, and he took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. Where? Right there. Then the, the stone sunk. I like that right there. It just sunk in his forehead. And he fell upon his face. So that's where I think he never, he didn't wobble. He just, just like big old John Tate. Boom! Hit that turf. God took him out of here. So David, in verse 50, prevailed over the Philistine. So then Saul, very, very shortly after this, in 18 and 10, and it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand. Uh, I know you know that David played the harp, and I know you know that Saul had the evil spirit, and every time David played the harp, that it would calm Saul. But then uh, Saul gives David his daughter to wed, and then in chapter 19, Saul wants to kill David. So why does Saul want to kill David? Because he's jealous of David. Why is he jealous of David? Because he's made this one out in the dust of the street and said, Saul killed his thousand, but David killed his ten thousand. Well, you know, and that, that really sets kind of where the state of the church is today. Right? I'll preach the message. We'll talk about people, program, places. But we, we really need to stay focused on preaching instead of programs. We, we need to really stay focused on just preaching the Word of God. 1 Samuel 21, 10, uh, 21 verses 10 through 15, And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul. So Saul's wanting to kill David. He reaches out on multiple occasions. Jonathan, his son, knits with David. Their souls knit together. They're best friends. Jonathan even comes to David's rescue in the end. Jonathan even says that I think he was next in line to be king, but no, David, you'll, you'll be the king because God wants you to be the king. And God arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. All right, so in 1 Samuel 21, 10, 15, and I'm just flipping through these as I go. 1 Samuel 21, verses 10 through 15. So David, Saul's tried to kill him, Saul's tried to kill him, Saul's chased him, Saul's done everything he can do in his power to kill David, but God keeps his protective hand around David. But then David is so scared and so in fear of his life that he flees to a Philistine city. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achash, the king of Gath, of the Philistine city. And the servants of Achash said unto him, Is not this David king of the land? Uh, did they not sing one to another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior. Now what did David do? That he... To, to get away, to get away because he was scared, he started acting like a madman. 
and started having, you know, doing things that uh, uh, were not becoming uh, King David. <laughs> he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself, uh, and himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let the spittle fall down from his beard. Then Achaz said to his servants, Lo, what are you doing? Get rid of this guy. So he did that to get out of the presence of Achaz. But then, we'll skip over to 1 Samuel 27. 1 Samuel 27, 1 through 7. And David said in his heart, I said, I'll perish one day by the hand of Saul. So he's so scared that Saul's going to finally get to him. Saul's going to finally kill him. He's afraid of his life. So where did David say? Did David say, oh, I'm going to consult God? No, David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. The land of where? The land of the Philistines. And what was, what was his psychological behavior here? He's trying to figure it all out himself. He's trying to protect himself. All he had to do was just lean on God. Amen. All he had to do is what he ends up doing, calling on God. And when you call on God, when you kneel down, and you get to that place at Ziklag, which we're going to talk about, and you get to those down parts in your life, and you can't get up, that's where God really wants to make contact. Yeah. That's where God can really do. When you're broken, when you're broken and you're down there, God reaches down just like Peter said, I perish. And he reached down that house and just pulled it right back. He said, no, <coughs> no, you with me. But why was Peter singing? Because he had taken his eyes off of Jesus. That's right. Why did David get in trouble? Because he took his eyes off of the Lord. And he tried to figure it out himself. When I fail, it's when I fail. God don't never fail me. But when I fail, it's when I try to figure it out so David arose and he passed over uh, let's see uh, David said in his heart I should now perish one day by the hand of Saul there is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines and Saul shall despair me to seek me anymore in the coast of Israel so in his mind he had all this game plan out right I'm going to go here and Saul's not going to chase me no more and Saul ain't going to try to kill me no more and then I'll be protected uh, to seek me anymore in the coast of Israel, so I shall escape out of his hand. Verse 2, 27. And David arose, and he passed over with 600 men that were with him under Achash, uh, the son of Maog, king of Gath, the Philistine city. And David dwelt with Achash at Gath, and he, he and his men, every man his household, even David and his two wives, Ahinanim, it, it, listen, I'll listen, I'll listen to these names and try to pronounce it, and I still can't, and I still can't pronounce it. Uh, uh, Ahinon, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the Carmelites, Nabal's wife. So we could go back into that story, too, where David had the request of Nabal, and Nabal said, who are you? And David said, well, I'll show you who I am. And I'm just paraphrasing here, and he ended up killing Nabal, slaying Nabal, and then taking Nabal's wife. And making Nabal's wife, his wife, Abigail. And it was told Saul that David fled to Gath, and he sought, so David looking good right here, isn't he? And he saw no more again for him. And David said unto Achash, I have now found grace in the eyes. Uh, let them give me a place in some town and country, that I may dwell there. For why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? And Achash gave him Ziklag. So that day, wherefore Ziklag pertains unto the kings of Judah unto this day. And the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four months. Well, what does that tell you? Is that God's will for a full year and four months, at least to that point? Why? Because he tried to take things in his own hand. So, 1 Samuel 29, verses 1 through 11. 
So now, he's either getting ready or wants to take his man and get ready and go into battle against the Israelites with the Philistines. Verse 29, now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek, and the Israelites pitched the fountain, which is at Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines passed on by the hundreds and by thousands, but David and his men passed on the rearward uh, with Achach. Then said the princes of the Philistines, What do these Hebrews hear? And Achach said unto the princes of the Philistines, It's not this David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, which has been with thee these days and these years, and I have found no fault in him since he fell unto me this day. And the princes of the Philistines were wroth with him. And the princes of the Philistines said unto him, Make this fellow return, that he may go unto the place that he has appointed him, and let him not go down with us to battle, at least the battle be an array to us, an adversary to us. For with should he reconcile himself unto his master? Should it not be with the heads of these men? Then Achish called David and said unto him, Surely the Lord liveth, thou hast been upright and going with the coming in with me, and the host is good in my sight. I have found no evil, I have not found evil in thee since the day of thy coming unto me this day. Nevertheless, the Lord favored thee not. Wherefore now return and go in peace, that thou displease not the lords of the Philistine. And David said unto Achish, But what have I done? And what hast thou found in thy servants so long that I have been with thee unto this day that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? <laughs> wow. Are you listening here? And who he's talking to? And Achish answered and said unto David, I know that thou art good of my sight as an angel of God. Notwithstanding the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us to battle. Wherefore now rise up early in the morning. My master's servants shall come with thee. And as soon as ye be up early in the morning. And have flight depart. Verse 11. So David and his men rose up early to depart the morning. Into the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went to Jezreel. Now. Now we got to where we need to be. Well, that's all right. Let's talk all about seven minutes. Now we're, we're back where David thought he was safe. At Ziklag, his city of refuge. I'm going to just let the Word of God say what the Word of God says. Ziklag burned and kept staking. And it came to pass when David and his men were coming to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag had smitten, and had smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. So, the Amalekites. So let's go back to Saul. So what did God tell Saul to do? He told him to wipe all of them off the face of the earth. Men, women, children, all. A-L-L. But does all do that? No. He left one. He left one. And he told him to destroy all the goods. Livestock. Well, let's go back here in just a second. I'll be there in just a sec. There 
it is. Yes, sir. We'll start at verse 1. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee. This is Samuel talking to Saul. To the king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken unto the voice of the Lord, the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did unto Israel. Now let me take you over here. Let me take you over here to Deuteronomy 25, 17. He said, I remember what Amalek did unto Israel. Deuteronomy 25, 17. Remember what Amalek did unto thee, by the way, when you were come forth out of Egypt? How he met thee, by the way, and smote the hinder post of thee? Even all that were feeble behind thee, and when thou was faint and weary, and feared not God. So Amalek and the Amalekites were a fierce adversary of the Israelites. So, now let's go back to Ziklag, chapter 30. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. So the city of refuge was no more the city of refuge. The city of refuge was burnt to the ground. So now you see what happens when we take things into our own hands. Right? So he fleed unto the... Uh, king and the king sent him to Ziklag. Now Ziklag's out of here. And he had taken the women captives that were therein and slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on his way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. So have you ever been in the position where you were weeping and you were crying and you were grieving and you couldn't cry anymore? You had cried every last tear that you could cry. He was in great depression. He was in great despair. But he knew who to call. And I'm telling you, if you've been in that position, if you're in that position, you call upon the name of the Lord. You call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You call upon the name of the Lord to serve. You call upon the name of the Lord to stay in His will. Then David and his people were with him, lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives. Again, Ahinom, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, so David comes to the city. The city of refuge is burnt. Everybody's gone. He's got 600 men sitting there looking at him. What are they want to do? Stone him. So David is not only in a state of despair, but David thinks he's getting ready to lose his life. What's that, Brother Wayne? The consequences of sin. So now we're in a big, big old tragedy. We witness and we're witnessing a big old tragic event in David's life. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you how he overcame that tragedy. David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him. They were to kill him. He thought he was going to lose his life again, even though he had escaped Saul. Now he's going to get stoned to death by his own men. Because of the soul of the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and daughters. But what did David do that turned the tide? Turned the tragedy into trial. What did he do? It's real simple. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. If you're in here tonight and you've been saved, then no matter what comes your way, you can encourage yourself in the Lord your God. So then David goes on with his men. I won't preach the rest of it for another time, but David goes on and he uh, encounters an Egyptian. And then I'll read you verses 16. We'll close with this through 20. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon the earth, eating and drinking and dancing. Because all the great spoil, and they had taken out of the great land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah, and David smote them from the twilight, this is the Amalekites, unto the evening of the next day, and there escaped not 
a man. The difference between him and Saul. There escaped a man with Saul, not a man with David. So David did exactly what God told him to do. He inquired of the Lord. The Lord gave him instructions. So when God has a plan for you, God has a purpose for you. God bestowed great mercy and great grace unto David in sick land. And he'll do the exact same thing for you, for you.